If you love wildlife and you want to go on safari, you are in the right place. My name is Hayden Turner. Welcome to Safari Live. Welcome to Safari Live, magnificent South Africa and Juma Game Reserve I am right at the moment. My name's Hayden Turner and welcome to a special edition of Safari Live, a special school edition. South Wales schools in Australia that's watching. It's so good to have you on board. I can't tell you how excited I am that this has all come together and thank you to everyone that has brought it together. Wherever you're watching right now, you're actually live in Africa. We've just got an elephant over here that Brian was just pictured on there and had beautifully framed up. He's, look at him. Youngster there just feeding away in the cool of the morning. It's about 12 degrees Celsius at the moment. Uh, I'll just get the Fahrenheit for you and convert that. But welcome everyone and particularly all the kids watching around New South Wales. So it's about 54 Fahrenheit uh, for people in the States and uh, anyone else that's watching. But a special schools edition, which I just think is absolutely fantastic that we can bring you this live from the magnificent Sabi Sands in South Africa here. So this elephant's just having a little bit of a, a feed here on some special things, some roots and some leaves and bark of uh, the, the particular species that it's on. But um, it's very dry here at the moment, everyone. So the elephants are pushing over a lot of trees and really eating the, the tender shoots that they can. We had elephants all around our camp last night. Elephants pushed over the gate uh, to our final control area last night. So there's a lot of Ellie's around. But you know what I think we should do? We should just sit with this, this boy for a little bit longer and just watch him whilst the sun comes up. And Brian will pan around to that just now to show you this magnificent sunrise. It's absolutely beautiful here in South Africa, 12 degrees. It doesn't feel that cold, actually. Uh, we're all rugged up nicely, and we're broadcasting live from our, our Land Rover and into your schools. So any questions you've got, please email them to us. Uh, the teachers will have all the email addresses, and uh, our directors will read them out to us. I've got Brent Leo Smith in uh, another vehicle, and the wonderful Jamie Patterson on a bushwalk this morning, guys. So that's going to be coming to you live. And our wonderful camera operator on the vehicle at the moment, a great friend, Brian Joubert, is going to be bringing you these beautiful pictures. So we might move on and see if we can find something very special for you, because last night we left a magnificent creature and we're going to go and try and find her and her babies for you. So any questions you've got, shoot them to, through to us. We'll answer as many as we possibly can. We can't always answer every single one, as you know. I think I just got a question, our first question from Mr... Can you just repeat, please? Mr... Mr. Root from Dolphin Galandra School, I think it is. I hope I got that right. Um, wants to know how, elef how old that elephant is. Sorry, I just started the car. Brian came back around to me. Um, that elephant's probably about five years, maybe six or seven years, even maybe a little bit older. A little bit hard to tell. It's always a bit of guesswork with elephant. But uh, the older they get, you know, we're looking at animals that live up to about 60, 65 years in the right conditions. Uh, and a youngster... A young bull, he's just here on the edge of a herd. There's a lot more elephant beyond uh, this one in the, in the thick of the bush there. And we heard them as we were sitting waiting to go live this morning. And what he's doing right there is just picking up, uh, kicking up a few roots with his foot. And elephants will do that. They'll, they'll kick up roots, they'll, they'll push the tree over, they'll eat the tender, moist uh, uh, particular parts of the tree that they fancy. And it's a bit like a a buffet for an elephant, uh, but at the moment, unfortunately, there's not a lot of it else to choose from other than the trees that are here. So uh, you can see how much, you can just see how he's using his trunk and his feet there. And he'll also use their tusks and they'll also use the middle of their head to push over the tree with that great strength. Um, we are looking at the most 
adapted uh, herbivore and everyone probably knows if you don't know what a herbivore is uh, kids ask your teachers right now and you can have a little chat about that talk about um, what herbivores are and what carnivores are uh, but for people that do have done that in whatever stage you're at at school um, isn't that fantastic he's digging up with his foot there right now herbivores uh, and that might be a nice discussion for you to talk about right now so we're going to move on and we'll leave this boy in peace thank you very much mr ellie lovely to be with you we're going to just drive up this road now a little bit further so what we might do whilst we're driving up here is I'm going to introduce you to an amazing, amazing guy uh, and wonderful, also another camera operator, Brent Leo Smith and Viam on camera. And they're going to go off looking for another really fantastic creature. It's so exciting to have us looking around, them looking around, and Jamie Patterson on walk, on foot, broadcasting live. We'll see you just now. Well, good morning to a spectacular dawn here in the African bushveld. As HD said, my name's Brent and I have the incredible VM on camera. And we are in search of the largest carnivore in Africa. So we're busy trying to figure out where a big pride of lions went. There are five females and uh, about eight cubs in the pride at the moment. So last night we had them very close to where we are. So we've just done a circle. What I'm doing is looking for their footprints. And so we can try to figure out where they went. And of course, as you know, please ask us questions. And it's great to have uh, all those schools on board for Taronga's centennial year. And uh, very exciting to be able to be help breeding the next generation of maybe game rangers, conservationists, and, and just general nature lovers. A very good morning to Lara, uh, who is at Chittaway Bay Public School. And Lara is wondering, how do we get so close to the animals? Well, Lara, it's a combination of things. Um, safaris have been going on in this part of South Africa since the, the late 60s. So the animals are quite used to the vehicles, but also if you drive very carefully and very respectfully around the animals, they let you get close. And often it's much better if you switch off, you let the animal come close to you rather than you forcing yourself into the animal space. But hopefully we'll be able to show you some lions nice and close in not too long. So what I'm doing at the moment, and you'll see me use the light on the road, it's not so I can see where I'm going, it's so I can see the lion's footprints. And then we're going to follow the lion's footprints till we hopefully find the lions. Now they can move quite big distances, but I'm hoping they didn't last night. Now here we've got an animal that would like to avoid lions at all cost. And at about one o'clock this morning, I heard these animals snorting in this area. which makes me think the lions were around. That is the impala. And impala is the most common antelope we get here. They're incredible creatures. So what we want to hear from an impala in a morning like this is a snort. <laughs> to tell us that the lions are around. They are looking a bit nervous, which could be a good sign for our lion hunt. Oopsie. Hi, Miss Shafe, who's at the Junction Public School. Uh, Miss Shafe would like to know how long have I been out in the bush looking for animals and tracking, etc. Well, Ms. Shafe, um, I've been quite lucky. I've had an unusual upbringing. So I can say I've been looking for animals professionally as a job for about 15 years. Uh, but uh, I've grown up in the African bush. And can you believe it that when I was small, uh, my school used to travel around with me. So I was very lucky we had a teacher who used to live with us in the African bush. And she only taught my brother and myself. And uh, my dad's quite an interesting character. So what he said, to us when we got the teacher to move out to the bush with us 
And he said to it, boys, well, it's your school. And um, what time would you like to start school? And we said 5 a.m. The poor teacher nearly fell off her chair and negotiated to 5.30. But we used to be done with school by 9.30 and then we'd be out into the bush with the anti-poaching guys, with the, with, with the game rangers, with the trackers. So I've been very, very lucky and very fortunate that I've spent the majority or almost all of my life in the African bush. Okay, so the lions were just over here last night. So let's look carefully for footprints. Now, VM, who's my cameraman today, is also very good at spotting lions and lion footprints. So hopefully, between the two of us, we're going to find you a big cat. So I keep scouring the African bush for lions. Let's go see how HT is doing in the south. <clears throat> so. Brent's amazing. He's, you know, if there's anyone that's going to find lions, it's going to be Brent. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. Um, but this is a collaboration. This is a joining of two organisations, Wild Earth and Taronga, Taronga Zoo, where I'm working back at. And I've got a great privilege to come out here and bring this to you guys. So it's very, very exciting for me. And Brent was just talking about his childhood. Well, Taronga played a huge role in my childhood. Um, and one of the reasons I'm doing exactly right exactly what I'm doing right here is because Taronga inspired me. I'm not going to talk about me much anymore here, but uh, you can ask questions later on if you want, or you can always ask questions by getting in contact with the zoo, and I'll try and get you it to emails when I get back. More importantly, let's go and find some animals. We've just had to go all the way around. Brian, what do you reckon, down this way? Yeah. Um, we've had to go all the way around. We were on our way to see if we could find a special, special creature uh, that I'm going to keep you in suspense with. But there was a lot of elephants right in the middle of the road, so we had to go all the way around. Now, I just want you to keep your eyes open as well, because I've got another special friend on this vehicle. He appears sometimes. I don't always see him, but... Um, he appears and he sometimes walks across the bottom of the screen. You let me know if you've seen him, okay? He's a very, very special friend, but I don't get to see him very often, but I always miss him. Tell me if you see him, okay? Let's see if we can find this special creature as well. So we've just got a question from Miss Shafay in the Junction Public School. Um, welcome aboard everyone, great to have you. I want to hear a big shout out from you, from Australia. Everyone in the class can yell out. Oh yeah, we got that Brian, didn't we? Absolutely. Fantastic. You know what? You are asking what uh, is the most elusive animal that we, we don't see very often here. Well, you know, I often think it's African wild dog. Uh, when they are here, we see them and it's absolutely spectacular, very exciting. Sometimes they're hunting for their food. So African wild dog's one of them. But the other one is cheetah in the big cats. Uh, we don't see them a lot, but when we do, it's very, very special. And then there's another animal that's really, really endangered, uh, and it's called a pangolin. Now, uh, Taronga supports uh, a pangolin species in Indonesia called the Sunda pangolin, but we've got an African pangolin as well. And uh, maybe you can have a little bit of an investigation on the internet or with your teachers about why pangolins are uh, so threatened and so endangered. But um, they're probably the animals, Mr. Fay, and uh, great question. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. So we're heading down the road now. The morning says elephants everywhere around here. I've got to be very careful, guys, because we need to make sure that we respect every animal that we come across, whether it be an impala or a, a small insect. We have to make sure we respect all those animals. And do you know what? I'm not sure if you've done food webs or food chains at school yet, but when you do, or if you do, again, ask your teachers and... Uh, and you can have a little talk about where the whole, every animal and every plant fits into a special system. And as soon as you take away one of those things, everything starts to crumble. So it's really important. It's not just the big things like the elephant. Uh, it's the little things as well. Really, really important stuff. So we're going across a damn wall now. What a great question we've got from Alex in Camaray Public School, just up the road from where I live, Alex. 
so good to have you on board guys and thank you very very much for watching and your question is is the African landscape similar to Australia well I have to tell you it really really is many times I'm driving along Alex and I see so many similarities you know and um, again because we've only got one hour I won't go into too much detail but I'm gonna you know maybe give you suggestions that you can follow on with your teachers and do a little project on and find out why the, the landscape's so similar and all I'm gonna say is the word Gondwana land if you have a look at uh, on the internet or talk to the teachers about where all the land masses split millions and millions of years ago you'll start to see how everything fitted together and I you know as we drive around the landscape is very very similar just the animals are different you know Australia got all these incredibly unique marsupials and other creatures Africa again a completely different group of uh, group of animals but Alex thank you so much for being on board so really make sure that today anything that you you want to follow up you get a, a little project going you can always get more information off the Taronga website as well and talk to uh, our education department for any ideas you might want to do an in situ uh, program at your school about maybe one of your threatened species around your area so really great questions guys keep them coming let's see if we can find our little special friend let's just see if we can find our special special friend here Brian I've got Brian on as our camera operator here and Brian's got another set of eyes in the sky because he's up a little bit higher than me so it's just Brian and I on the vehicle and uh, Brian can see a little bit higher than I and it's great to have another set of eyes but we're looking for something very very special here and let's see if we can find her. The great thing about what we're doing right now is hopefully, and all the kids in the cities that are watching and all the kids in not so close to cities in remote areas are watching, and this is the great thing about Safari Live. We can bring you this safari right into your schoolroom, and I really, really hope that uh, you follow us and you follow the guys here, because when I come back to Australia, uh, there'll be other amazing people doing this Brent Leo Smith Jamie Patterson and James Hendry and lots of other people but oh look at this yes 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 so exciting oh my goodness I can't tell you how excited I am oh have a look at this this is brilliant wow oh my friends we just found Karula and her cubs. Oh, I'm so excited. Guys, we are looking at a magnificent, very famous female leopard with her two cubs. Oh, I tell you, I can't explain to you kids how excited I am for you. This is a wild African leopard with her two seven-month-old cubs. Look how beautiful they are. And they're playing at the moment. They're also keeping a keen ear open because Karula, she got some food for her, her babies last yesterday and she hunts. So you know what, sometimes the, the bush is, uh, is a little bit harsh and we might find it a bit harsh but all the animals have to eat and these animals are carnivores so they eat meat and they can eat anything from, they also can eat insects sometimes when things at times are tough but leopards are the most, probably the most adaptive cat in Africa. Now, when I mean adaptive, if you don't know what that word means, ask your teachers as well. And I mean, it basically means that they can really survive in very, very different habitats. And habitats is just places where the animals live. So as long as there's lots of food around, and if times get tough, they'll eat small things, but if the food is available, like bigger things like impala or different antelope, they'll also eat those. And yesterday, she got an impala for her, her babies, and they've had a, a big feed on that. They've got full bellies.
but I am so excited that we are sitting here with Karula, and she, as I said, is a very, very famous, famous leopard. Ah, oh, this is just the best. Isn't that beautiful, guys? Just magical stuff. So this is what we do out here. So we've got a question from Nick Stark in Lupus Garden School. Welcome aboard, guys, and thank you very, very much for joining us this morning on this live safari. And you're looking at Karula at the moment. You want to know what leopards eat. Well, just sort of carrying on from what I was saying, they, they have a very, very broad diet. They can take anything from, you know, a small uh, reptile or even been known to eat crickets in some parts uh, to right up to small giraffe. I mean, there's been some incredible uh, footage of that in, in some parks very close to here. So they eat a broad range of things, but mainly their prime uh, food around here is antelope. Uh, there's an antelope called an impala. There's another antelope called a kudu, a young one they probably take. Um, there's also some smaller uh, antelope called dica and steenbok. And also warthog. So, you know, the, there's a food chain that works. These are called an apex predator. And for people that aren't sure what that is, and if you're not doing that at school at the moment, um, then the teachers will explain to you what that means in, in simple terms. But if you are doing working in, in right up in uh, the top end of your, your biology, apex predators are the predators that are at the top and then... Uh, There'll be a food chain that occurs right down underneath those apex predators. And then you might be also wanting to maybe design a food web at school together. And that might be a really great thing to do with your class as well. So thank you very much for your question. And uh, that's what leopards eat. But wow, what a sighting we have here on our beautiful leopard. And she is just so beautiful to see. And she's so um, comfortable with us. Now that's something else, kids, that I want to explain. Why don't, um, why don't they run away? They won't, don't run away because we are no threat to them. They are very comfortable with us. They've been, this uh, leopard here has known us for over 10 years. And uh, she is very, very comfortable with us being here and her cubs. But she's sitting there keeping a close eye out. And uh, those cubs were born on the 2nd of February this year. So I can't quite see where they are. Brian, do you think we should move forward a little bit, mate, and have a look? <laughs> Mr. Root in Gilgandra Public School, how cool is that? Gilgandra, you're watching a live safari. Great to have you. Give us a shout out. Oh, yeah, we heard that from Africa, that's for sure. Fantastic to have you on board, Mr. Root. A great question, how old are they? Um, Karula is about 12 years of age, and the cubs were born on the 2nd of February, so that's really cool. The cubs have gotten to seven months of age, and that means that there's a really, really good chance that they're going to survive, because sometimes the cubs can fall victim to other predators, which is quite sad, but at the same time, it's part of life in the bush, and uh, at this age, there's a good chance, but she's also a fantastic mother. Mr. Root and Gilgandra Public School, welcome aboard. We're just going to reposition so I can see if I can get some picture of the babies for you. It's okay, my girl. Just going to just drive over here. I think the, the cubs are just down in this little... Uh... Okay, whilst we're doing that, I'm going to reposition because it's a bit noisy. We're going to go over and see someone very, very special. Jamie Patterson is on Bushwalk. We'll see you just now. Good morning and welcome to the amazing African bush. My name is Jamie and the man holding the camera, his name is Jandre. Now it's all fine and well being out on the vehicle and getting to see the animals right up close and personal. But there's something very, very special about being out here on foot exploring some of the smaller details that we might get to see out here. And before they all disappear, 
Let's have a look at what spent the night in this big open clearing. Some impala wandering about. Now they know that we're here. They've seen us. Obviously I'm not being quiet. But they're not too stressed out. Now generally with our animals out here, they react very, very differently to us on foot than they do to the vehicle. But it does give us an opportunity to get right up close and personal with all of the different things that you can find that you don't necessarily spot from the vehicle. Now, I've been very fortunate in my childhood because although I grew up in a city called Johannesburg, which is one of the biggest cities in the whole wide Africa or South Africa, I spent lots of time visiting the bush, going out on school camps, and I've just always felt incredibly at home out here, wondering about the wild and enjoying the different things that we have. Now, one of the things that we do do when we are children in South Africa, and you've got to be careful here. You've got to do it without <laughs> Chandra stepping on sticks. <laughs> what you do. So we've seen those impala. If you look closely here, you've got to find some nice poo. This is impala poo. I know it's impala poo because of the shape and the color. You collect some that's nice and dry. I wouldn't advise it with any wet poo. And definitely don't put anything in your mouth that you wouldn't, that you haven't checked with an adult first. But this is a game that we play in South Africa called Bok Drol Spuch. And I'll show you how it goes. First of all, okay. And now, what's this? Oh no, that was a pathetic one. One more, one more go. <sighs> that was a bit better. And the competition is to see that you can spit it as far as possible. Now, don't go and collect fresh impala dung because it's soft and wet and you really don't want that in your mouth. And you only want to do it with herbivore poo. Only herbivore poo is okay to do this with. Definitely, we never touch any of the carnivore poo. So hyena scat, lion scat, leopard scat, that's really gross. This is okay though. No, I'm definitely not going to win this competition genre. Would you like to try? Give it a go. There we go. Genre is going to spit it at me. <laughs> that was a good shot, Genre. Our Luke is garden school. We saw the impala dashing off into the distance. And yes, lions will eat impala. Now, it depends on how many lions you have, because lots of lions need a big meal. That makes sense, doesn't it? If you're lots of lions and you're big, it's like going to a buffet, but then you've got to go and get something like a buffalo. Make sure that you over-cater rather than under-cater. But if you've got one or two lionesses and they're feeling particularly hungry, then they will eat impala. Now, impala are the most common antelope in our area, so in this particular part of the game reserve, which means that they're a very important food source for all sorts of things, from leopards, cheetah, wild dog, even hyena, spotted hyena will hunt impala every now and again. And that's particularly true in the next few months when the impala give birth because then they've got lots of little babies wandering around which is perfect food because they aren't obviously as fast or as alert as the adults. Now before we go any further I have to introduce you to someone but he's running away. <laughs> Over there is Herbert. Now you can see Herbert walking in front of us. Now Herbert's job is to help us find something, sort of basically a third set of eyes while Jandra and myself talk to you and film whatever's out out here. So Herbert goes ahead and he is a master tracker, so he is really, his expertise is finding big animals. And he walks ahead to make sure that there's no elephants or lions, or if they are, that we know that they're there so that we don't surprise them or they don't surprise us. It's very important to walk responsibly out here. It's the best feeling in the world when you get to see an animal, a big animal on foot, but it's really, really important that we remember we're in their home and that we must respect them at all times. Now that's something I know that Hayden feels very, very strongly about, and he's currently sitting with one of our absolutely favorite leopards. Let's go back to Hayden and the Queen of Juma. Well, welcome back to uh to Karula and 
Kids, I wanted to show you this. I think it's really important that you, you see how that food chain works. And uh, Karula has gone down to the kill that she made there. And you know what? You might find it a little bit sad here and there, but you know what? It's a very, very important thing that we all understand how that food chain works and how that balance of nature is. So what she's doing there, she's got an impala that she took for her, her youngsters last night to feed them. And she's just covering it at the moment to try and hide it. One of the youngsters has just walked up to her too, which is really cool. And then she's just giving her a little bit of a... The baby's playing with her. But I just think it's really important that you see that the natural world uh, happens right before our eyes here in, in Juma and in Sabi Sands in South Africa. It happens in your habitats as well, wherever you are in Australia or anywhere else in the world. Animals have to eat, and that food chain is a really, really important thing. So as soon as we uh, take something out of that food chain, uh, lots and lots of other animals are affected. So that little baby leopard is just uh, having a little bit of a sniff around and wanting to have some food, having a bit of a play. So his mum was uh, covering it up because she wants to keep that, that food there for the babies and make sure no other predators. Now, if anyone can send us an email, one of the schools watching maybe send us an email, tell me what another predator you think might come and take that, that impala away from the leopard. Let us know and tell us... Tell us what you think. Got another question coming through in my earpiece from Ross in Camaray Public School. Welcome aboard again, guys. Thanks for watching. Ross, you want to know what other predators may or leopards may have? Well, there's animals that uh, definitely are threats to leopards, that's for sure. Um, and I would say... Not in any particular order, but they are hyena and lion. Also wild dog, African wild dog. And if you haven't seen one of those before, have a look up online or maybe some pictures in some books that you've got and uh, check out. Those three animals are the main threats. Um, and they can also be very, very uh, uh, a great threat for their cubs. But they also have a tendency, particularly hyena, uh, steal kills. Now, the leopard, out of all the cats, has one trick up its sleeve. And they can haul their kill that animal, they could haul that up into the tree and stash it up there and no other animals can get it. And that's one of the advantages that leopards have and one of the, one of the reasons why they're so successful. Uh, they can adapt to so many different environments and hauling their, their food up into a tree. The reason why it's on the ground there is because she wants to keep it down there for the cubs to feed on. But great question, Ross. Thank you very, very much. Are they still down there, Brian? I think they are. We've got a question from Miss Kylie in uh, Nora Public School. Miss Kylie, I think it is, in East Nora Public School. I think that's what it is. And you want to know Nora Public School. Thank, is it Nora Public School? Do, sorry, I'm just getting my message. Uh, yeah, Nora Public School, I do. Sometimes... Um, when it comes to stealing the prey, lions will steal the prey, uh, or sorry, the, the, the kill from the... Oh, look at that, beautiful. But also hyena will do it as well. So we're looking at a leopard at the moment, and she... This is Karula, we know this leopard very, very well, and she's um, got her cubs down there. But um, Miss Kylie, they will have a tendency to keep an, a very, very close ear and eye out to make sure that hyena or lion... Uh, don't come and steal that, but sometimes wild dog will do it as well. But she's kept it down in this what we call a little gully or a little um, a little dry creek bed down there, and the scent wouldn't be uh, travelling as much as it would be if it was up here on the higher ground. Um, I'm just going to try and reposition our car so Brian can get a better spot shot of her. Um, let's just move forward a little bit. Got a question from Mrs. Ran in Gora Khan Public School. Please excuse me if I don't pronounce these, the names of your school correctly, um, but uh, we do our best. And 
your question is, uh, sorry, let me just move forward again. I've just lost, oh, it's a bit tricky there. Brian might be able to get down through there, can you, mate? I'm coming to you, Mrs. Round, I promise. Uh, can you see that? It's a really tricky position for us. I just get the question again, please. I do apologise. Okay, there are leopards endangered, Mrs. Rand. Um, I'm going to have to go back where we were, bro. I'm sorry, mate. Mrs. Rand, I'm sorry. I'm <coughs> just um, negotiating the, the landscape here to try and get a better picture for you. Um, are leopards endangered? Well, look, leopards are not endangered. They're probably the most uh, successful of all the cats. But there's some areas that they're probably threatened. I'm just looking for a better shot for Brian here. Is that the best you're going to get, mate? It's a long way, isn't it? I do apologise, folks, but Brian's going to zoom in on that as much as he can. <coughs> um, leopards in some areas would be uh, definitely threatened, and there's, there's particularly uh, leopards in some other parts of... Leopards occur right throughout Asia as well, Mrs. Ran, and maybe you can look that up as a little project about where leopards do occur. Um, there's going to be leopards in pockets of Asia that are definitely threatened and endangered um, just because of... Well, maybe you could also research that, but I'll give you a couple of hints to, to why leopards in some areas might be... Uh, threatened and that's normally due to habitat loss and that's one of the most important things we have to learn about and maybe your class can do a little um, a little project about habitat loss and uh, see why some animals uh, do have great threats from their their habitat being taken away from them so that's why protected areas like where we are right now and protected areas in Australia and all over the world are so important but Mrs Rand thank you very very much for your for your question and welcome aboard. So we're, we're just looking at um, this beautiful leopard here right now, Karula and her cubs. She's got her babies and, and that her food down there that are killing a very tricky position. Now she's moving off and she might go into a spot where we get a better picture. We'll just follow, wait for her. The kids, are, the little little ones are playing down there. <clears throat> and I'm going to try and the little ones are playing beautifully. I just got to try and get into a better spot. So just to explain to you where we are, it's um we'll just link link to Jamie and see what she's got on the bushwalk for us. And I'm going to try and get this vehicle into a better position because I really want to show you these cubs. But let's cross over to her and we'll see you just now. Look at what I have found. A giant pile of elephant poo. And just look at the size of it. It's bigger than my head. That's what I wanted to show you. And it's nice and fresh. Now, I know this might seem really disgusting. And I promise I'm not totally obsessed with poo. But there are really interesting things to look at out here because it tells you so much about the animal that you might get to see out here. So let's take this as an example. First of all, this is a big animal, clearly, because this is a very, very big poo. But if we look a little bit closer, and I will wash my hands after this, I promise, look a little bit closer at what this animal eats. Grass, lots and lots of grass in here. And then if we look closely, let's see if we can find something else. Um, there are all the leaves. So it's something that eats grass and trees. And then we know that it's an elephant. But this also tells us something else about the way that the elephant digests its food. Because look how much of this is undigested. It's rough. There's lots and lots of grass still in here. Lots of trees, lots of grass. So an elephant's digestive system works really quickly, but at the same time is very wasteful. That's why elephants need to eat all the time. And they do. They eat all the time. An adult elephant could eat 300 kilograms of food and poop out about 100 to 150 kilograms every single day. Now let's compare it to something else that I just happen to have in my pocket. Let's pop that down. Ew. 
So gross. It's a little bit gross. That's okay, I'll wash my hands afterwards and no harm done. So if I dig in my pocket and I find some impala poo that I just happen to have, as you do. Okay, so obviously much smaller, but that makes sense. Impala are tiny, but let's break it open. Can I do it with my fingers? Nope. Okay, why don't you look at the pretty sun while I break this open? <laughs> And class 2C in the Junction Public School, welcome to our bushwalk segment. Have a look at this. Okay, so obviously I've just broken it open with my teeth, and they want to know what impala poo tastes like. Well, I usually don't chew it, um, so basically it just tastes like the dirt that is around it, because all I'm doing is putting it on my tongue and then spitting it out. But there, where I bit into it, it kind of just tastes like dirt, to be honest. But what I wanted to show you is, with it like this, as fine as it is, you can tell that an impala has a completely different digestive system to an elephant. And that we know because they're ruminants, which means that they chew their food, swallow it, then bring it back up, chew it again, and then they swallow it and then they digest it properly. So that's why an impala for its weight, kilogram for kilogram, needs to eat less than an elephant. So there you go. Nice and fine. And my hands are very dirty, I know, I'm sorry, it's okay. My hands are dirty and then I go and wash them and then they get dirty again. So let us leave our impala poo and our elephant poo because this is actually a really important source of nutrients for something to come along. And give it some thought, what do you think might live in, and you guys live in Australia, so you may well know the answer to this straight away, but what animal would be very, very keen to use some elephant dung as its home or as its food source? Give it some thought. I bet you know exactly what animal it is. Okay, I'm going to try and get rid of as much elephant poo as I can off my hands. Right, so we're going into some slightly thicker vegetation, and this is where it's important for us to make sure we pay attention and concentrate and look at the area around us. So while we're walking, we're constantly scanning to see if there's any animals in front of us. And we're thinking about the type of vegetation that we're in because that will tell us what animal we might find. Now in this particular area, we're going into a drainage line. And we're going to go and see what wonderful things we can find. In the meantime, I'm going to send you back over to Hayden, who is still with the wonderful Spotted Queen. So guys, we're just still with uh, Karula, and at any minute she may put this, this kill up a tree. I'm not sure she's going to do it, kids, but she may do it. She's just turned it over. We can't really get a better position than what we're in now. And we're just watching her, still looking after this, this meal that she's got for her cubs. Now, if any of your classes want to do a little project on food chains, that's a really, really good thing to do as well, which we talked about before. And you'll have a look at, see whether the, the leopard is at the top of the food chain or at the bottom of the food chain, and you tell me. But you also need to get back to me if anyone can send us an email about what animal you might think could be a threat to Karula right now that might steal that food from her and her cubs. Let us know if you can. And the first school to get back to us, we can give you a little shout out live here from Africa. Isn't this fantastic? So while we're watching Karula here, we're going to cross back live to Brent because he's got some really, really cool creatures that got in our way a little bit this morning. And I'm sure he's going to tell you loads about them. We'll see you just now. So we've just found a massive herd of elephants and there's a very big bull in here as well. Now of course these are incredibly big creatures, let's just move forward a bit. And uh, a big elephant bull can weigh about 7,000 kilograms in this area. And we've got a young bu youngish bull on our, our right here, the big Ellie bull's off to the left, we'll try to catch up with him. Hello mister. Hello, mister. So this guy's probably about 30 years old.
Well, a good morning to Mr. Barksman at Camaray Public School. And he's wondering what function does an elephant's trunk form? There we go. It's basically like a mother, it's an arm. There are over a hundred thousand muscles in that. And they're incredibly dexterous. They're able to pick up the smallest little leaf or fruit that they're interested in. And here we go, you can see how incredibly powerful it is. Look at that, so he's going to break through, he's eating a leadwood tree. Um, inside of an elephant's mouth is like an old boot. It's tough, they can munch on the biggest thorns. Well, a very good morning to Mrs. Rant at Bora Khan Public School. And she's wondering, do elephant, female elephants have tusks as well? Uh, they do. What I'm going to try to do is zip around. They're going through some thick bush there and catch them on the next open area. And there's a whole bunch of females and babies there as well. But yes, they do. Now, the tusks uh, in females are more used for, for feeding. They're able to debark trees with them to get to the nutrient-rich cambium layer that transports water and minerals up from the soil and from the roots. And with males, they use it for feeding, but as well uh, as for fighting. Now, females will use their tusks for fighting, but it's not it's a secondary uh, use rather than their primary use. With the males, again, the fighting is obviously far more important, uh, so they have access to females. Okay, now there's probably about 40 elephants in that group. We could only see a few of them on the edge of the bush. So we should be there in a few seconds. There they are. Hold on, bumpity bump. So Miss Pike is wondering what do you do with an, when an elephant charges you? Well, Miss Pike, it all depends on the exact uh, situation and it, it is very very dependent on the mood of the animals uh, and uh, the situation where you are most of the times you can stop an elephant charge with a well-meaning stop it naughty elephant works quite well for me um, or tapping the side of the car making a noise that's unusual so there is that really big bull and he's got quite an interesting uh, little adaptation there we well, got an adaptation uh, an injury that's caused him to have a floppy ear. Okay, I'm just trying to see. There he goes. And you can see he's absolutely massive. I'm going to try to get us in a position where we can see him next to a female. And you can actually see the size difference between them. So there we go. He's going to walk up to those females there. And you can see how much bigger he is. Now, look at this quite interesting behavior that's happening here. So that elephant bull is in must. What it means is he's got he's a heightened hormonal period. So he can only mate with a female when he's in must or estrus. Uh, he's basically, when she's in estrus and he's in must. So he's trailing the herd, looking for a female. He might be able to smell that there's a female about to be ready to breed. And uh, that's why he keeps following them. Now, it can make the elephants a little bit less relaxed. Especially when there's a big bull, there we go, you can see that she's not too happy, doesn't want the big bull to come too close to her. And they can be very, there we go, see, there could be a bit of trumpeting and screaming. Look at the size of him, he is massive. His head alone probably weighs a thousand kilograms. Okay, here comes one more, it's the same little bull that was with us earlier. Good morning to class 2C at the Junction Public School. 
great to have you on the back of the world's biggest safari vehicle. Now they're wondering, do elephants always travel in herds and how many? And not always. The bulls, when they're not looking for ladies, they'll travel by themselves and or in small bachelor groups. But the females are almost always in herds, and it's generally a related family group. So there'll be a bunch of females, sisters or aunts or whatnot, and they'll all travel together. And you get little bulls like this, and he's not quite old enough to challenge for mating rights. And they hang around like this one is on the periphery, so just 100 meters or so I'm behind the rest of the herd. And if they get a bit close, sometimes the females get quite upset with them and give them a good disciplining. Okay, so he's going to walk right behind us. Hey, big boy. So he's probably got another couple of years left before he is big enough to challenge the big males. Morning, Miss McDonald, in a Beer Cross Public School. Uh, and she's saying, how do you, can you age elephants? Well, with the elephant bulls, it's a bit easier, uh, just from size and indentations in the skull. Uh, cows can be a bit more difficult. Oh, look at that. Yum, yum, yum. Bush willow for breakfast. Oh, and you can hear in the distance trees being broken and cracked by the rest of the herd. Okay, so we did have some lion tracks and tracks of lions with cubs before we bumped into these elephants. And we're going to keep looking for the lions. And while these elephants continue to have their breakfast, let's go see what fascinating things Jamie has found on foot. While Brent goes to look for the lions, I actually have quite a good idea as to where they may be. And the reason that I know that is because over there in the direction of the west, I can hear kudu. So it's a very big antelope and it's making a sound that goes bah, bah. And they do that when they're scared, and they only really do that for lions and leopards. And the lions were just off to the west there. And when I'm finished showing you this, I'm going to go racing with Herbert and Jandre to see whether we can't find what's ever scaring those kudu. And zebra. So the zebra have also been going, yip, 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 yip. So they, I think there's lions hunting over there. So we're going to race across there in a moment. But first, I was telling you that bushwalk is all about seeing the little things. Look at what we've got here. We've stumbled upon a crime scene. Uh, something has come through here and started digging. And that something, I know, did this at night because the soil's still fresh and wet and it's only just first thing in the morning. He stood with one foot here and the other foot over here. And then down here, look at this. You see this imprint? So something with a long tail and very, very sharp claws. So why was this animal digging here? Well, the bodies of his victims are strewn all around here. Look at this. This is what he was after. And let's find a nice example for you. Can you see them there? Termites, a very different species of termites to the ones that build the big termite mounds. Shame one of them is still a little bit alive, and these poor things probably didn't see it coming. Well, the artifact came and scraped with its huge claws, digging beneath the surface of the, of the termite mound, and then all of the termites started swarming out, and with his long tongue, long sticky tongue, he started lapping up the termites. Now, if you ever find yourself lost in the African bush, and I don't think you will, but if you did, Termites would be a very good food source, so it's not just artifacts that can eat termites. We can eat termites as well. And apparently they taste like peanut butter, but I'm not going to eat them right now. Jandre is very disappointed, but I'm not going to eat the termites. <laughs> We're going to go and investigate the sound of those alarm calls, but while we do that, we've got a long way to go running. We're going to send you back over to Hayden. Well, our friend, our beautiful girl here, Karula, has moved into a much better... Oh, what's that? 
that's that's my little friend the thumb look at him there he is he's coming across the bottom of the screen yep that's the little guy i wanted you to look out for he's going to make an appearance every day for the next four days there he goes he doesn't come out for very often the thumb we've got Karula sitting here folks and i'm just so glad that we found her for you and we've had a fantastic morning with you thank you all so so much for watching jamie is great she's so incredible her knowledge is incredible and just on bushwalk to think that that's live coming to you live from africa and brent with those ellies how wonderful so great great news to have you all on board there's the little cub and just to give you a bit of information it might be a great project for you all to do as well find out about how long different animals are pregnant for or how long it takes for them to have their babies now you'll find some really interesting things if you compare the carnivores to the herbivores and maybe you can do a little bit of research and do a project on that so the the uh, leopards we have in front of us here they're pregnant for about a hundred days so you know what those after a hundred days those little babies come out and they're only about 600 400 to 600 grams so that's about i don't know the weight of about three oranges that's how much they weigh when they're born now the cubs are then hidden by the mum for about six weeks and she puts them in either a cave or a little thicket or something like that and then she sort of moves them over different places over time and then their eyes open between six and ten days of age and then they can start to eat meat um, after that and then after about three months they don't drink milk anymore from their mama and uh, they start to eat meat and uh, she brings them to the, the food that she kills for them and uh, then then it all happens they start getting bigger and stronger and then they start to become big leopards so it might be really good to do um, a little project on that as well so really important stuff to find out how these animals work and their habitats and where they live now I've got something really special to do we had a little little idea that we were going to give shout outs to schools that are watching this morning so I want to be able to hear your school from Africa it, when I read out your school's name I want you to shout it out so loud that we can hear it and I want you to cheer and give yourselves a big cheer for watching and thank you to your teachers for getting this together for connecting us and getting everything together so here we go I'm going to do this as best as I can. Please excuse my pronunciation if I pronounce your school incorrectly, but I'll do my best. So, Lucas Garden School. Yep, heard you then. Fantastic. Camaray Public School. Wilkins Public School. Malawi Public School. Naura East Public School. Callahan College. Thank you, guys. Walls End Campus. Lansdowne Public School. Daceyfield Public School. Monavale Public School. Roos Public School. The Junction Public School. Gorakan Public School. Gilgandra Public School. Fantastic, guys. Tyala Public School. Beecroft Public School. And Beecroft, Mrs. McDonald, and your class, you got the answer right what predator would take potentially take that kill hyena po beecroft well done fantastic stuff guys oh i heard that cheer that's brilliant uh baron joey montessori school warimu public school chittaway bay public school musselbrook P south public school fantastic guys curry curry high school brilliant stuff a great high school um Camaray public uh tugra public school <clears throat> McDonald Arana Heights Public School, Douglas Park Public School, and I've got Beecroft again at the bottom. So, folks, absolutely amazing to have you all on board, and thank you to Taronga, Taronga Conservation Society and Wild Earth for allowing this to happen and collaborating, getting it together so we can broadcast live to you from the African bush. And what this is all about, kids, is learning about why nature is so important it's incredibly important and you guys you guys are the little soldiers you're the soldiers in our army you're the new recruits coming through that's going to protect our planet so what you've done today is the first step in making a change changing behavior and changing the planet and making it better i can't tell you how good it is being to have you on board this morning and i'm going to leave you whilst we go to this beautiful leopard and you can just have some pictures of her to finish on new south wales public schools taronga conservation society wild earth you rock
Right. Well, that was really, really good fun. Really super fun. And uh, some of the schools may be just going now. Their bell would have gone at 3 o'clock in the afternoon in Australia. And thank you all the other people that are watching from all over the world and how, you know, thank you for understanding that that's such a special thing to do for, for kids. And um, we're back with you now uh, on our regular... Well, I don't know if there's such a thing as regular drive because every drive is different and uh, every walk is different. So I just want to thank everyone uh, for that was listening, that was in a school, at school, for uh, for listening to uh, the way we, we, we took the spoke and we, we got messages across there. So back to our regular sort of chat about this beautiful animal and so many people uh, welcome aboard if you're a first timer uh, to Safari Live and uh, also for all our regular Safari Live viewers um, great to have you back on board. So if you've just joined us we're sitting here with um, Karula one of our most famous leopards here uh, in Juma and Arethusa and Cheetah Plains, uh, and also in Sabi Sands, she's very well known, but she's got all, two cubs with her who are playing around at the moment, just out of our vision. We're in a very, very tricky spot here to get uh, pictures, and Brian's doing an amazing job. We're doing an amazing job getting uh, the pictures to you. We're going to stick with her, <coughs> Brent Leo Smith. Uh, and Jamie Patterson are uh, with me this morning and Brent is on drive and Jamie Patterson is on walk. So I'm going to cross over to Brent and uh, see what he's up to. He's always up to something and uh, I'm sure it's going to be wonderful. We'll see you just now. Well, we're following the Nkuma Pride. They've crossed into Arethusa. I'm just trying to see where their tracks have gone. So we're on a parallel road at the moment. Okay. Unfortunately, we are very close to the Sibambini boundary with Arethusa. And I'm really hoping the tracks don't come slightly to the north. Herbie just called me, saying he thinks he heard them in this area calling. So we're going very slowly. Now, the fortunate thing with all those cubs is just literally a mass of tracks. It almost looks like a herd of impala of crust. So I, Vim and I sneak slowly through the Arethusa private game reserve looking for lions. Let's go see how Jamie's doing on Shank's pony. We're going to see if we can't help Brent in tracking down, down those lions. So while we were standing in the drainage line chatting a little bit to the kids about the artvark digging that we found, we heard alarm calls off to the west of where we are now. Now, as we've crossed through the drainage and up and following across in that direction, we can hear two of them roaring. Herbert, who of course is the master tracker, and after his demonstration yesterday afternoon, I think it's all safe to say that that is absolutely the case. He is a genius in the bush, and his instincts are absolutely 100% spot on. He says there's a male and female, and that they're somewhere, either on Juma or on Arethusa, but they're close to the boundary. And that we must go and we must search for the tracks and see if we can't find them. So Herbert's walking ahead, making sure that everything is absolutely safe for us in front, and also so that he can find the tracks and see if we can't find them. And it would be ideal if we could find a male and a female rather than the rest of the lion pride with cubs. <laughs> How Aubrey, <laughs> sorry, I'm chuckling. Aubrey is wondering about the message that we passed on to the school kids and of course my incredibly now dirty hands which I will wash off and Aubrey's question well why is it safer to touch herbivore dung rather than predator dung and the answer is yes it's to do with the bacteria and it's to do with the parasites that are in predator scat 
predators, because of their diet, they often eat rotten meat. I mean, plant material is relatively inoffensive. Rotten meat, on the other hand, is a little bit offensive, and it also contains worms of all kinds. I mean, if you've ever closely, closely examined lion vomit, Aubrey, which I don't suppose you have, but let's say you had had the opportunity to closely examine lion vomit. I realize how weird that sounds now. I didn't mean it to sound quite so strange. But if you've ever had the opportunity to examine lion vomit, you find all kinds of revolting things. In fact, you shouldn't actually, to be completely honest, you actually shouldn't touch lions with bare hands. Even when they're darted and you're dealing with them, which I've been fortunate enough to do, to deal with some relocation of some lions, you use gloves because their saliva, their stomach contents, they're just um, a seething cesspit of bacteria and parasites. Not their fault. That is just the way it is, and you would rather avoid exposing yourself to that, because if you've got any open cuts, if you touch your eyes, your mouth, ugh, ugh, <laughs> it gives me the shivers just thinking about it, because it really is very gross. And scat is no different. Scat, hyena scat, it's actually one of the reasons why you've got to be careful with tortoises as well, particularly old tortoise shells, and even just picking up tortoises in general out here in the wild, which of course we don't do now, because it's the dry season, and in a defense mechanism, they actually excrete all of the water that they have stored. So you really don't want to mess with the tortoise at this time of year. But you also don't want to mess with them because they eat hyena dung to supplement their calcium. Hyena scat, actually, if we want to be official about it. They eat hyena scat to supplement their calcium, but as a result, actually carry a host of parasites and bacteria. An important little lesson, if you're going to pick up a tortoise, wash your hands. If you're going to pick up a terrapin, you're silly, because they really stink. You don't want to do that either. I can't believe how warm I am. It's definitely, spring is definitely on its way, compared to the last walk I did, when my fingers turned blue. Okay, let us see if we can't find where these lions are. Herbert is striding ahead. I think he... He wants another experience. We were just talking about watching a lion hunt and what that experience might be like on foot if you can find somewhere safe to watch it. So while we go and attempt that, not, we're not actually going to attempt that, but while we attempt to look for the lions, Hayden, of course, already has a leopard. Let's go back across to him. So we've stayed with Karula, folks, so I just think it's... um. It's great to see her in this in this location. It's a very tricky location, as I mentioned, but she's just moved into a a better position for us, particularly to see her. And I'm waiting to see a bit of maternal care and a bit of cub interaction because they are playing around at the moment. But I think they may come back up to her at some point, um, which they normally do. She's got a close eye on them, but as the cubs grow older, they sort of venture further afield and start to explore a bit more and gain their, their, their skills, whether it be just their, their athleticism or their, you know, training and playing with each other. Um, but they start to venture out and become a little bit more adventurous. But she's keeping a very, very close eye. And just uh, whilst you were with Jamie, she, she sat up in a very beautiful position to look at um, a noise that she heard. And... Um, it was just a really great demonstration of uh, that keen, incredible sort of feline beauty that she has. And uh, she sat up and it was no, not a threat or no danger, so she relaxed again, started grooming herself. So just in case you've, uh, you're wondering where we are, to give you a bit of a location, this is a, dry, a drainage line or a sort of dry creek bed um, down in front of her there. And we are elevated. We're about probably... 15 or 20 meters from her up on the, the level ground and she has uh, a kill down below that um, just over to the right where Brian's moving around now and what she's been doing is covering it with dirt and, and leaves and sort of stashing it down there which is some people might find, out, find unusual why she doesn't put it up a tree and cash it up a tree but she's leaving it there for the cubs to eat uh, as and when they please, but also trying to cover the scent of it uh, with that dirt. And as Brian and I came around the corner, um, she did, uh, you could definitely get a bit of a, a bit of a whiff of uh, it because she did kill this yesterday morning or early yesterday morning. So 
Isn't she just beautiful? Grooming herself. Nearly all cats are very particular about uh, their condition, and they do a lot of spend a lot of time grooming and looking after themselves. That's such a beautiful, beautiful shot of this leopard. So I'm going to just stick with her, and um, please, I hope this people don't think it's a bit indulgent, but. Uh, we have been with her for over an hour now, so we're just going to stay with her and see if she does go up this tree and just start to relax. But whilst we're waiting, we'll stick with her and we'll cross over to Brent because he's with another of my favourites and uh, we'll see you just now. We're trying to follow lion tracks at the moment, but we've hit a large traffic jam. And I really do mean a large traffic jam. And it's the same herd we saw a little bit earlier crossing uh, triple M, and they've stopped and they're now spread out feeding. So I see if we can see that big bull again. Here he is with his floppy ear. So they spread out through the bush. Yeah, there's that big ball. You can see how oh, oh he's tall. Nice to have some big big Eddie balls again. Let's just try and move forward a bit. Now we are of course on the hunt for lions, but we're never gonna say no to a lovely herd of elephants. big ball. Might be a bit of upset. Oh, does he stop? Oh, he stopped to feed. She looked like she was going to get upset. She's got a very small calf. You can just make out through the, in the bush there. And sometimes these big must balls can be a little bit trying for females who are not in estrus. Okay. Oh dear. We have another traffic jam in the road and off to the left, two young bulls. Addy says, elephants are the best kind of traffic jam. I agree wholeheartedly, Addy. Um, this is definitely my ideal Monday morning traffic at work. What's going to happen here? Hello. Let's say hello. Here we go. A little, lovely little greeting between two young bulls. Now Michael's wondering, do elephants ever inbreed? And he says he considers it unlikely because of how long the bulls have to mate, wait to mate. But I'm pretty sure they might encounter their natal herd and their wanderings. But elephant bulls can wander vast distances. I think I'm using his feet. Ah. So that, look at that, is kneeling down to get a little bit more purchase to pull that whole root system out. Now, time to use the foot.
Hi, Amber in Colorado. Uh, Amber is wondering, aren't elephant bulls more aggressive uh, to humans when they're in must? It's, it's M-U-S-T-H. Uh, they can be. I don't find them that aggressive. I think it's just all about reading their, their body language and behavior. And they're, they're definitely a heightened hormonal time, so if, if, if you do something silly, they're more likely to react. But I don't find them more aggressive at all. There you go. He's got his root. Yum, yum, yum. Okay, here I'm crunching it. Unfortunately, the lions don't seem to be roaring again, which is unfortunate. They help us find them a bit more easily. And we're not moving anywhere at the moment with being surrounded by Ellie's. Ah, there we go. Maybe that one's going to let us get a gap. Thank you. All right, so while we keep searching for the Inkahumas, Jamie's got some striped donkeys. More specifically, we have the stripes that I think encountered the lion earlier. And the reason I say that is, as I said, we had the kudu alarm calling, but we also had zebra going yip, 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 from this direction. And I think it's safe to say that these two males... Sorry. I'm listening to what I thought was an elephant, but is not an elephant, in fact. It is an elephant. They're running. Cool. Let's go that way. <laughs> to that termite mound. To go and see what's going on. Uh oh. Which way are they going? Okay, let's go into the termite mound. What scared them, I wonder? Well, as we've seen before, Impala is one option. We saw that the other day. Okay. Let's go up onto the termite mound. The other thing I want to do is just tell them that we're here. Because they're panicking. Okay. They have moved off. What was that about, elephants? You okay there, Jandro? Cool. Let's come up here and just see if we can't get a view. You up? Cool. So, just to talk you through what happened there. I thought it was actually... There they go. Can you see them there, Jandre? Okay. Something scared them. Not us. But they were running in our direction, which of course isn't what you want. Must ball. That's what scared them. <laughs> okay, so we've taken ourselves up onto higher ground. We want to let them know that we're here in a way if they would just keep running. Oh, he's pushing them. He's pushing them, pushing them, pushing them. It's a must ball that's stressing out the elephants. But this is a good place for us to be. We're up high. And you cannot underestimate the advantage that height gives you. Particularly with a big elephant. They've stopped to feed. So some of them are relaxed. I'm just keeping an eye on what's going on. So we're in a nice position. We're in the open. We've got about a hundred feet between us and the elephants, which is plenty of distance. But I just want to stay here and assess the situation. We're now moving off. Unfortunately for us, the wind is doing a little bit of this today. So what that means is that it's blowing our scent around. We're okay for now, but it is they're about to walk straight into our scent trail. Well, they might come and investigate, which is why I think we will stay up here on the termite mound, assess the situation, and then decide from there. So while we wait for our elephants to move off, let's go over to Hayden and the Queen. It's 
So, folks, we decided to um, leave Karula. She went down into that drainage line, and we couldn't even see her. There's a tiny little bit of vision. We could see her lying with the cubs, but that's that's the way it goes. Uh, you know, the animals dictate uh, the script, and we just follow on. Um, really, really nice to see her this morning and just be around her uh, and particularly for the schools the school specials that we did for the first hour so thank you again for everyone um, being with us for that I'm just going to toodle along here and just see what else we can see I'm heading towards uh, Juma Dam now and yeah I just think kids education is so important uh, it's just incredibly important in this day and age for us to use the technology as opposed to shying away from it. Use the technology and try and weave it into the fabric of uh, their, their future. Get these messages across to them and if we can change a little person's mind in any way, shape or form, uh, any behaviour, any thought process with through Safari Live and all the other things that we do with zoos and other education, other outdoor wildlife education anywhere in the world, um, all the better, all the better. And I was asking everyone yesterday, uh, so I got a message, sorry I just stopped halfway there because I was getting a question uh, from James Richard. Uh, Hi James, how you doing? Great to have you on board as usual, mate. Um, it is, uh, what sort of conservation efforts are Taronga? Where we well, we've got um, a lot of different conservation projects going on. We've got some uh, breeding projects within the zoo, and these might be foreign to Safari Live, of course, because they might be an Australian species or an Asian species. But we have a, a very successful uh, breeding program with a breeding program. Sorry, with a a frog called the Corroboree frog, incredibly uh, successful uh, breeding program. The problem with a lot of frogs in the world, the threat, one of the greatest threats is a, is a virus called chytrid virus. Uh, it's in many parts of the world and one of our frogs, they got down to I think a number and I, I need to probably be corrected here, but uh, I think it was about 50 individuals. So um, we've got an incredible uh, team working on that. One fellow in particular, Michael McFadden, who's a good friend and a, and a great uh, scientist working on that, and all the rest of the team, breeding them and then releasing them back into the wild, which is a great thing. Another bird in Australia called a Regent Honey Eater was down to extraordinary, uh, uh, extraordinarily low numbers, um, incredible reintroductions and uh, breeding programs for that as well. And then if you go further abroad in Africa, we've got, uh, we support a lot of work going on with uh, gorillas. Uh, we've supported a lot of work going on with chimpanzees in the wild as well. And in, um, in Asia as well, huge uh, support funding for uh, Sumatran rhino breeding projects. We've had a very, very long standing uh, breeding program going with Sumatran tigers as well. And one of the animals that I'm very fond of and I think uh, people need to know and learn a lot more about is uh, pangolins, one of the most threatened and trafficked animals on the planet at the moment. And uh, please, if you want to have a bit more of a look on that, uh, do some research because there's some really, really tricky stuff going on uh, with, with pangolins. Uh, there's a, the, 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 the pangolin that we support some projects on in, in Indonesia is called the Sunda pangolin, um, but the African pangolins are also incredibly threatened and I would really, really suggest if anyone wants to do some further reading, look that up online uh, and check it out. So we do some amazing stuff and I'm really, really proud to be back working there. And that's where it all started for me, James and everyone else, just a little quick uh, update of why I do what I do um, and how privileged I am for this sort of stinky little ex-zookeeper to be allowed back on Safari Live. You might find it a bit weird that there's an Australian working on this. Um, well, the Safari Live team tolerate my uh, bad humour and my accent, but uh, <laughs> Africa's been in my blood for a very long time, ever since I was a little kid, and I've done, you know, for the last sort of 25 years, I've been working in and out of different African countries, uh, but the zoo was where it all started for me, and when I got a job as a zookeeper at Taronga in Sydney, uh, that was my dream come true, and then I just had a chance meeting 
very, very, just a chance meeting with some VIPs that came into the zoo and I got the opportunity to show them around and they, I, they asked if they could see the giraffes and they just happened to be four executives from National, Geogra ne National Geographic Channel, sorry, and uh, a gentleman that was there, Brian Smith, he had an idea that, because I was going to Africa anyway and I'd resigned and I was going to work on some rhinoceros programs in Zimbabwe and uh, he thought it might be a good idea that I take a, a video camera with me and uh, send back a little story every week. Well, I did 72 of those and uh, over two years and I shot it myself <laughs> in my hand. So it was the, the beginning of selfies back in sort of 1997 and 98 and over the next few years. So that was a pretty incredible experience and that's where it all started for me. And uh, it was a dream come true. Uh, so I'm very fortunate uh, to be doing what I'm doing, but you know, I don't, I don't live here, so I have, I'm a generalist. I've got some knowledge from the past and things like that. But you know, these experts like Jamie and Brent and and James, uh, that that I just learn so much from them always, and all the other guides as well. I think you know, South Africa's got some of the best guides in on the planet. Uh, and I'm very, very fortunate to be in this magnificent country. I love this place. So, let's just have a look what we can find. Here. It's a little bit quiet now. The temperature's rising a little bit. It was 12 degrees this morning, uh, which is in the 50s Fahrenheit. So what I might do is just tootle along here and scratch around and see what else we can see. I'm going to try and make my way up to Buffelsook Dam, which I haven't been to for a while. I don't even know if it's got water in it or not, um, but I, don't, I doubt that it will. And we'll see what we can find. There's a lot of elephant uh, tracks along here, uh, so we'll see what we bump into. But let's cross back over to Jamie and see what she's up to, and we'll see you just now. While Hayden tootles off, we're not tootling anywhere just yet. I'm still waiting for these elephants to decide exactly where they're going to go and what they're going to do and also to make sure that there's no other elephants trailing where they were. So Herbert thinks that also they also ran like that because they caught the scent of the lions. Now you wouldn't have been able to hear what we could hear but it was the rough equivalent of about 25 brents driving through the bush towards us. So that was the, the sort of the equivalent noise that we were experiencing racing towards us. So that's what that's why we reacted like we did. But while we're sitting here waiting for our elephants to decide and actually basically for them to walk into our scent stream, look what we found here. Hidden beneath the surface of this termite mound soil. And some of them have been exposed and I'll pick them up for a moment in a moment and show you exactly what we've got. And look at what we found. A squirrel's stash of marula seeds. And I know they're marula seeds from the shape of them and also the very, very characteristic telltale signs. So while I'm holding that, let me grab a stick with my left hand. Okay, my left hand's not very coordinated. We go here. In here. Oh, goodness gracious. So this characteristic place where the squirrel has used its teeth, specially adapted teeth, to crack open the husk of the marula seed and get to the obviously the food store for the seed and also all of the essential oils that are contained in this marula seed. So for an animal that can get into it, it is very, very nutrient rich. And this clever little squirrel, because I mean this has not come from, there's no marula trees where we're sitting. We've got a, a protector of a jackalberry which is ideal, that's exactly what I want between me and an elephant herd if they decide to come through in this direction but no marula trees so this squirrel has gone and collected one by one maybe from elephant dung but also then from just off the ground from where the marula trees fruit and he's come and he's dug it into a termite mound and I also think what's happened here because these are old these are really really old to me filled with dirt I think the termites actually might have assisted the squirrel in burying his stash. If I try and scrape through some of these, this is a seriously hard soil that we've got here. Okay, well clearly I wasn't meant to be an archaeologist. Here we go, great gentleness, there's people cringing. Ew, there we go. Whew. 
got it out. These are old, and I think that actually they popped them. <laughs> Chandra. <laughs> Poor Chandra. He is the absolute best person to have on Bushwalk because he is so steady and very, very, very strong. And he's also very perfectionist in terms of the shots he gets. However, sometimes he stands on things that shouldn't be stood on. Stood on? Is stood even a word? Stood on. Things that shouldn't be stood on, um, which includes some crumbly termite mound that just collapsed underneath his foot. You okay there, Jandre? That's um, he's now stretched out in a very Olympian pose as he holds the camera. Well, anyway, that's all we had to show you because I'm actually going to stay here until the elephants have moved. They've moved off now. I think we've probably got another minute or so just sitting here assessing the situation, and then we can toddle off, as Hayden would say. Um. So while we try and get down from this crumbling termite mound and while Jandre demonstrates how he's going to stand up, which I'm very keen to see, uh, okay, fine, you show off. <laughs> Did it perfectly smoothly. While we decide how to escape our elephant, ouch, that was uncomfortable. Termite mounds are not comfortable. I don't know how leopards make, make this happen. Anyway, while we toddle off, as Hayden would say, let's go back to Brenta for an update. Well, these lions are giving us a, quite the conundrum. This they've gone into Arethusa, and now it looks like it's, they've come back. And there's only one little area we haven't checked yet, and that's between here, where, we're, where we are now. So we've got tracks going into Arethusa there, but now the guys say further along, it seems like they're coming back. And we only haven't checked this little section towards Sandy Patch. So fingers crossed, all Inkahumas will be present and accounted for and playing and hopefully even munching on something. Uh, remember, we're on a live African safari and you can send us questions by using the email address questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag safari live on Twitter. So I'm just listening to the Game Drive channel. Okay, so it sounds like the tracks are heading east in Arethusa, and this is the only area we haven't checked, so let's just go very carefully. See if we spot a kitty cat sleeping under a bush. tracks just yet. So it's quite a thick area here. There's a little river system, lots of quarry thickets. So it could be a good spot if you have been walking all night and you're a bit tired, have a schnooze. And also a good area for hunting last night. There's quite often quite a lot of animals in this area, sort of zebra, impala, uh, buffalo. listening carefully. Okay, no luck yet. The tracks are still heading in our direction. So we're going to focus on really trying to find these lines for you. While we do that, HT is at one of his favorite spots in Juma. Well, folks, uh, one of my favorite spots in Juma, that's for sure. But wow, I've never seen it quite like this. Uh, this is incredibly dry. Uh, there's little pockets of probably pretty rank water down there and uh, Brian and I were just talking about as we arrive we've seen this go through so many changes and particularly Brian has been here nearly two years since we started uh, the the live drives in this format in November 2014 and it's got to the point where it's so dry plovers and a few others but uh, very very dry 
Um, you can start to see a couple of the pathways there where hippos have probably walked out. And there might be a hippo or two that comes back and sits in here, uh, but this is a, a pretty, uh, pretty low state of affairs when it comes to the water supply. So I just wanted to come up here and have a bit of a look. Uh, the sun is really bright, just reflecting straight off a piece of water there, so I do apologise uh, if I'm squinting. But it's really interesting to see, and nature just lets this go like this, you know. Got a question from Michael about is the the climate in Australia and the climate in and where we are in uh, Africa similar? Well, I'm just covering that sun beaming into my eyes here, Michael. Um, absolutely, we've got great similarities. We fall in a very very similar uh, area around the Earth, and uh, if you have a look on a map or on a globe, you'll see the similarities between where the uh, African continent and the Australian uh, continent uh, falls. Look. You know, rainfall, there's lots and lots of cyclical, uh, you know, weather um, climates that, that change and, and weather that changes, and that's all normal. But uh, coupled with, uh, if you want to have a little bit more of an investigation of uh, what's going on with uh, scientists' prediction of El Nino, um, that is going to have an impact. And that's a, a sort of two to five year cyclical uh, um, impact that occurs out in the Pacific and Indian Oceans and you know um, without banging on about it too much uh, that can have a huge impact on on weather patterns and and uh, it definitely feels like it is the word that I'm getting from a lot of people that live in South Africa that know much more about it than I do because as I said they live here they've definitely seen um, this is a normally a dry period of the year the winter but it's exceptionally dry uh, on the shoulders of this uh, this season so fingers crossed it all comes right it always will animals change animals adapt and uh, we do as well but uh, definitely definitely to keep an eye on Buffalo Sook Dam we've seen it nearly full little blacksmith's plover just down there bry Just got a little uh, blacksmith's plover down there. A common bird to see, but I just love them. I think they're fantastic, and they get their name from that beautiful little call. Which he stopped. That little tink, 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 tink. Sounds like a blacksmith's uh, anvil being hit by a hammer. Fantastic little bird, and always see those around uh, the water points. Got a question from Lindsay, and Lindsay wants to know do I have any advice for a budding zoologist? Well, Lindsay, my advice to anyone that wants to get into any sort of biological science or any wildlife industry or related uh, area is passion. You know, have the passion. Obviously, people will think that the competition is greater in this day and age because there's a lot more people that uh, have got access to all different forms of technologies, but that can also be, be an advantage for you, you know. You can get a lot of advice from people. I mean, for example, what we're doing here on Safari Live, asking the question live. But I definitely say, uh, Lindsay, passion is really, really important. You know, it, as much as you possibly can. Volunteering is a huge thing as well. I think it's very important to try and volunteer, even if it's with a local organisation that's close to home with you. And, you know, show your passion and just follow your, follow your dream as well because it's very, very easy to get sort of pushed down and get... You know, suddenly you think, oh, I just can't do it anymore because I'm not getting the breaks. Well, eventually you will. Um, who knows when that is uh, for everyone, but eventually you will. And I think, Lindsay, the most important thing is just make sure you stay passionate. When you're doing something you love, uh, it doesn't feel like work. That's for sure. But, you know, 
sometimes you've also got to make adjustments to that. You might have to do something else for a while, which I've done many a time, and I'm sure everybody else watching can, uh, or with us on the vehicle today, uh, can empathise with. Uh, you do have to make changes in your life just to get through, but at the same time, just follow your heart, follow your passion, and stay optimistic as much as you can. And uh, yeah, that's what I'd really, really advise. But thank you so much, Lindsay, and great to have you on board our vehicles today. So it's a little bit quiet, Brian and I were just mentioning before. Uh, that's one of the great things about the, well, many a great thing, but one of the special things about the bushwalk and what Jamie's doing now, because we don't get out of the vehicles with our, uh, when we're on drive so much, you know, we might just get out of the vehicle to pick something up to show you, but the bushwalk has got an incredible ability to get down into those, the nuts and bolts and the nitty gritty of the, the bush, whereas we're sort of scanning the area. We've got the bloodhound, Brent Leo Smith looking for line, and as I said before, if there's anyone that's going to find him today, uh, he will. I'm just sort of familiarising myself with these up roads. I'm heading up towards the Cheetah Cut Line at the moment and uh, just looking for any tracks or spore on the road as well. We found a lot of elephant. Uh, there's a lot of elephant on the, on the properties at the moment. I'm um, having a bit of an impact, I have to say but uh, great to have you on board. And yesterday, as I said, I asked the question to anyone, if you want to tweet in a comment about when your sort of love nature moment was, when, you know, just a little, a little memory of what, you know, what was that moment that sticks in your mind that uh, when you actually, all the, all the sort of colors on the, the Rubik's cube of nature came together for you. And, uh, whether it be a moment you had with your parents in a, in a woodland or a television show or whatever it might have been. It's great to hear from everyone and just uh, know what it was for you. Right, I'm going to ask right now, and I love doing this, the first person to tweet in right now and tell us to go left or right, you're going to govern what we do here. You're going to govern where we drive. I'll turn off for a second. It takes a couple of seconds to come through. And uh, we are a junction. We're at a junction in our life, just like I was talking about with Lindsay before. You have to make a choice sometimes and go down two different paths. But I'm going to hand that over to you and tweet us in, the first person that we pick up, uh, our wonderful directors and producers in the final control room will send something through to me in a minute and tell us to go left or right, and you will dictate what we see. Sometimes we see loads, sometimes we don't. It doesn't matter. It's just great to come to that fork in a day and not know what the future is going to bring. So uh, we often do this. Okay, that didn't take long. Justin, absolutely fantastic to have you on board. Justin said, can we go right? Justin, we can certainly go right. Let's do it. Thanks so much, Justin. Great to have you, mate. Just another little little question from Justin. Um, what's my top five favourite animals? Um, uh, well, let's, let's stick with African ones because um, we're in Africa, and I've got lots of favourite animals, Justin. But uh, in Africa, I'd have to say, okay, up there for me in the big cats is leopard. That's for sure. I'll try and do one from a di couple of different groups of animals uh, from the herbivores. I'd have to say uh, giraffe, uh, even though I do love elephants and, and a lot of other creatures there. Uh, let's go for a bird, and I'm going to say, I'm going to say the lappet-faced vulture, one of my favorite birds. I just think they're absolutely brilliant. Let's go for a reptile. And I'm going to say boomslang because I watched Brent Leo Smith with a boomslang last year. I think it was in Big Cat Week. And it was one of my most favorite interactions that's ever been on Safari Live. 
he was on bushwalk and he was with this boom slang for i'm telling you it was if anyone saw it uh they'll know what i'm talking about but normally the snake will take off or whatever but this boom slang was just in the tree and with him for about 15 or 20 minutes it was an amazing encounter and i love watching that so boom slang is my reptile and as my insect hmm i think i'm going to say African millipede because I just think they're the most coolest millipedes in the world. They're so big and I just do love millipedes and how uh, wonderful they are. So they're probably my top five uh, for the moment. So Justin, thank you for the question. Right, so it's a little quiet out here folks, I have to say, but that's all good. That's how it works. That's the theatre of the bush. We are just mere uh, sort of members of the audience really uh, and watching it as it unfolds every day um, but you know what we should do I think we should cross to Jamie now and see what she's up to and what other wonderful things she's looking for we'll see you now can you believe it we are back on a termite mound we have been chased up onto a termite mound by our second herd of elephants of the day so all is going well here on bushwalk Here's what's happening. We've been trying to track lions. Lions have been crossing backwards and forwards from Juma to Arethusa. Their scent is everywhere. It's, the wind's picked up, so it's blowing very, very harshly. The elephants came running once again towards us when we were walking in this block. So we have skedaddled. Uh, quite literally, I think that's the best description. We have skedaddled. And we're sitting on a termite mound waiting for the elephants to decide what to do. Most of them have gone. I just wanted to sit a little bit longer because they would have heard us. So sometimes what happens with elephants is they get curious, especially on a windy day where they can hear, but they can't smell what they're hearing. So they would have heard us shuffling along, and they, I'm a bit concerned they're going to try and come back around and approach us from downwind just to see what's going on. So we're waiting here for another minute, and then we are going to skedaddle again, off back towards an open area because <laughs> this wind has picked up. It's now howling. It's blowing grass and hair and frightening the animals. Plus there's lions coming back this way and apparently more elephants coming this way. It's just time for us to go, I think. What we have decided, what we have discovered, Balanites Zoe's Road is the home of the elephants this morning and not the home of the people. We will be leaving. So while we make our way away from all of the elephants on Juma, let's go back to Brent and find out an update from him about those lions. So we've had a bit of success. Now, the lions are not far from us here. They're just down the road. But they are, look like they're about to cross into Vuyatela. So what I'm going to do is I'm letting the guys from the west who can't follow into Vuyatela get a view of the lions before they cross. And then, and then we will go and follow them once they go into Juma. So they're probably about 100 meters away from us. And uh, hopefully they're going to cross in the next little while. We're just standing by here, and I don't know how many lions, there's males there with all the cubs are present. From the tracks, it looked like all the cubs were around. Well, looks like they might have gone for a snooze in Sibamili. We might get a view across the boundary. But as I said, there's three vehicles in there now, so we're just going to stand by here. So while we wait to get a view of the incredible Inkomas, let's go see what HT's up to. Folks, I've just pulled up here um, just to show you some of the impact that the elephants are, are having at the moment. Uh, and just to talk a little bit about that, you can see the, the size of this tree. It's not certainly not a, a baby or a sapling. It's quite a big, big tree, and that's been pushed over by an elephant. Uh, now, the elephant would push that over. It's a marula. Pushed it over to get the, the leaves at the top or any leaves that were left or any tender young sort of twigs at the top. And you know how varied the elephant's diet is. Uh, it's, they eat everything from bark to leaves to grass to roots to the fruits to seed pods, all different things. And 
Um, at the moment, because the grass and the vegetation and the other uh, smaller shrubs are so, so low, um, we are finding that the animals are being pushing over a lot of trees at the moment. So it does change the habitat and obviously in a, a managed area like a national park or a private game reserve you do have to uh, consider those things and maybe take some action uh, which we are experimenting up on quarantine at the moment with some different um, uh, substances that repel the elephants to just to keep them away uh, from those trees but um, it will change the landscape and over time that landscape will end up being not as wooded and probably more grasses and then that in turn comes with another selection of, of creatures so look it is an impact there's no doubt about it um, we're seeing a lot of it and we are monitoring it and the the all the sort of uh, management teams that are in Sabi Sands and all the reserves they they keep a very close eye on that but coming back after seven months, I'm definitely seeing uh, that impact. <clears throat> so I just got a, a message from Michael uh, that said that his, his moment was when he was about three or four years old, I think. I think that was in the in the comment, uh, and when he was watching Big Big Cat Diaries, which is another great program, uh, another great program, and you had that that major moment, Michael. Welcome aboard. Fantastic to have you with us, mate. And those sorts of things really do uh, really do change your world when you have that major moment. And you just watch and you think either a I'd love to do that, or a I'm hooked on that program, or whatever. And uh, they do have a great a great change in your life so thanks again Michael for being on board and your your comment there and your little moment that you had where your love nature switch was flicked on by a TV program one of mine I mentioned it yesterday was a a program called um, called Wild Kingdom in America <clears throat> that was broadcast in Australia there was this great guy that I just used to think wouldn't it be great to be him by the name of Marlon Perkins he had a great big white moustache wore safari suits used to stand in front of Kilimanjaro and talk about vast herds of wildebeest galloping across the plains I loved him I just thought he was a legend he was great and rest in peace Marlon <clears throat> I think we just had a message from Alyssa. Just let me con confirm that is the right person's name. I do apologize. Control, was that Alyssa? Okay, sorry, thank you. Thank you very much. Alyssa, or Liss for short. Um, lovely to have you on board. Alyssa, your moment was watching Steve Irwin. Uh, wow, do some work with crocodiles and uh, yeah, Steve, shame, um, Steve Irwin again, rest in peace, but uh, you know, Steve was a really interesting character, amazing, amazing guy that uh, did a lot to engage kids again and also in his legacy I have to say uh, he has left an amazing amount of uh, vast areas of land that he's protected um, in his in his in his time so <clears throat> that's off to him as well that's off to everyone that's had ever had an impact even if it's just been in your environment first thank you Alyssa for your moment too that's really great to hear um, I think you can also do incredible small things in your local area try and investigate what you can do back home and I think Safari Live is a, a great catalyst for change in people's worlds if you might not be able to get to Africa or you are on drive with us right now so I hope you feel like you are you're definitely with us that's for sure and we we feel like we've got the biggest safari vehicle on the planet but if you want to make an impact after 
in your local area, it's really great just to go and investigate that. Try and join up with a volunteer group or help some organization in your local area and have an impact. Because you know what? Local to global to local is really important as well. Um, <clears throat> we've got some incredibly beautiful creatures that we have here on these reserves, but there's some beautiful animals where you are as well, wherever you are watching in the world, and it's really important to protect your own your own habitats and your own wildlife because that's where your kids are going to have their first memorable moments. Really important stuff. I think the handle was Mobile Paddy, if I've got it right. Mobile Paddy, thanks. Um, you, thank you very much. Uh, Mobile Paddy, you want to know whether the condition of Juma is worse or better than I expected? Look, um, I didn't really have, I knew that it was going to be dry because it always is this part time of the year and that's what one would expect. One would hope that it wasn't anything but dry because uh, that's the way the seasonal changes work. But I think the, the thing that we're, I'm just noticing is uh, the impact of elephant smoke, uh, really, on, on it. And I don't think, as I said, you know, nature will always ride itself, but always oh, a little, little diker in the road there. Oh, they don't stay for very long. Let's see if we can find this little diker. It's a little common diker. Oh, and a little steenbocky just ran across the road there as well. This little die car. Uh, let's see if Brian can get a little shot just through there. Can you see, Brian? Just, just pulled up there. Beautiful, beautiful little creature. We don't get to see them very often because they do do exactly what it says on the tin. They, in Afrikaans, die or diver. Uh, they will just head off into the bush and then there's a little steambok, I think, is it, Brian? Can I? Yeah, there's a little steambok behind there as well, which is very, very cool to see. Two different species, two different species in the one shot, which is just beautiful. Um, and, you know, I do love diker. I find them just a, such a special creature and we don't see them very often. And she's just, or is it he? I can't see in my monitor. I can't see, I've got sunshine right in my eyes here. But the most important thing is we've got a beautiful little um, little picture of of that beautiful, beautiful animal. And standing there, staring straight at us, which is so cool as well. Look at that. Thinking we can't, he, we can't see her, or it. I can't see if it's a male. My monitor has got sunshine beaming all over it at the moment. But really cool to see these little creatures out having a morning, morning browse. Very comfortable with us at the moment as well. Oh, that's super cool. They really do. They've got that lovely sort of, uh, there you go. <laughs> Look at that, that lovely gut. They dive through the bush there. That was so nice to see. That was a lovely little sighting. Oh, fantastic. I do love antelope, my favourites as well. And then we've got a little steenbok. All right, what we might do uh, is go across to Brent and see what he's up to and get a little update from him, and we'll see what other little creatures we might find around here. We'll see you soon. So unfortunately the lions decided to head towards One Eye Pan for a drink. So they were on their way to cross the boundary in front of us, but then they changed their mind and went north. But there's a good chance they will still cross before the end of the safari or on the sunset safari. So we are still in the area. We decided to just kind of a quick look around Sandy Patch and see what creatures are about here. So far, not too much. And we are hoping for some out in the open areas. Remember, questions at wildearth.tv or hashtag safari live if you'd like to ask us any questions and of course sometimes I'd like to do a bit of role reversal and I'll ask you guys a question and I think that's a 
a perfect time for that today. Hmm, what are we going to quiz on today? What do you think, Vim? Okay. I'm thinking of 59 batteries. I know. Okay, Vim thinking about some technical battery, uh, which is probably not a good one for me to quiz you on because I won't know the answer. Mm, but let's think of a nice quiz to do. Um, ba -dum -bum -bum. Mm, let's think of it. Let's make it a little bit tough today. Oh, and there's not much out in the open. Very quiet out in this section of the world today. But of course, there are always trees. And I know what we're going to have a quiz on. Mm -hmm. Hi, Amber. Amber's wondering what is the tallest tree we get out here. I would probably think it's one of the very big jackalberries uh, is the tallest tree, or African ebony. They can get very tall and very big. Let's have a look. I know there's one of these trees around here which could could catch you out so hopefully our tree our tree buffs are ready and waiting and I think it's definitely going to be a nearly impossible tree quiz and it's going to be a little bit more difficult because we are in the dry season and some of them don't have leaves so you've got to sort of look at the general size and shape of the bush. Aha, uh -huh. there is the bush. There are a few leaves, so you are lucky. There it is. Very, very, it doesn't have any thorns, but it almost looks very spiny. But those little spines that look like thorns are bare fruit. And it's fruit that you've seen a lot of us eat. So that's uh, the hint for you. And uh, there might be be a color in the name. So hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv for the nearly impossible tree quiz. This is going to be a tough one. I just want to see if there are any flowers yet there might be. Okay, let's have a closer look. See if there's any giveaways and see there's a few dead leaves uh, but these little things that look like spines over, ooh, and spikes here are actually what the fruit grow on and sometimes I thought there might be a little bit of a, a flush or a flower after that late rain unfortunately not so it's going to make it really difficult for you let's have a look underneath it see no, I can't even see any seeds here okay well it is a called the nearly impossible tree quiz for a nearly impossible reason uh, hopefully we've got some tree buffs out there on this sunrise safari. Yeah, let's see what else is about. Not even too many birds uh, at, in this area at the moment. I was hoping for a few bird species, but there's quite a cold wind. Now, our first answer in for the bush, is it a silver cluster leaf? It is not a silver cluster leaf. So, I you know, have to back to the drawing board. I'll see if... Uh, at, in this area at the moment. I was hoping for a few bird species, but there's quite a cold wind. So our first answer in that'll have more leaves, more identifying features. I'm still waiting for the day that we spot a leopard in that particular weeping boar bean. 
And we've got a big weeping boar being off to the, the left here. And we've seen Tingana try to take a warthog carcass with very little success up that tree. But for me, it always looks like the perfect leopard tree. Still yet to see a leopard in it. And it is not. Is it one of our evergreen trees, the Scotia Bracapatella, the weeping burby? So come on, guys. I think I've got you with the nearly impossible treeless bush this morning. Ah, there we go. James, Richard, and Shannon, you are. Well done. I thought it was going to take a little bit longer for anyone to get that. I'm going to have to find a harder one. Oh, off he goes. Yes, and we shall do the same. Let's have a quick check in with the guys in the west. Just, uh, do you think they're going to head for the east or should I make my way out of the area? Gobby, thanks very much. Sorry, I must have been on the other channel. Okay. Gobby, thanks very much. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to go across to Hayden quickly. It seems like the lions are on their way to us, so I'm going to try and get there as quickly as possible. Well, I just wanted to stop with these beautiful creatures. And you know what? I know everyone sees them a lot. And if you're just a newcomer with us, then that's obviously a really great new animal for you to see. But these are some of the most incredible antelope on the planet. We're sitting with Impala at the moment and you know, I can't drive past these beautiful creatures. They're, you know, we, we see them so often, but you can't, sometimes we give them a cursory glance, which I use that, that sort of phrase quite often, but you cannot, you cannot. These are just too beautiful. They're, they're a one of a kind. They're, uh, they don't have any super close relatives uh, the, in, in the antelope families. They're, they're very, very special. They've got this incredibly graceful build about them, and I love that. They're, some scientists just think that they are the most um, beautifully designed antelope. Uh, they can browse. Look at that. That's great. Right in front of us, Bri um, Brian's got that female in shot, and she's got oxpeckers just hanging on her, <laughs> annoying her. I'm just trying to see which ones they are. 
That's a young male. I do apologise. I just put my binoculars up too. I was looking here from afar. It is a youngster. He's a young male, but he's got um, he's got some red-billed oxpeckers pecking away there in his ears, annoying him, but at the same time doing a great little job removing some parasites, and that's fantastic. It is a little young male. I do apologise there. Um, got my binoculars on now and uh, it's just a lovely 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 herd really beautiful herd it's full of young males and females and there's a there's a couple of adult males there as well these guys are like in f famous for their for their jumping and their abilities when they're alarmed you know they they do an incredibly high jump and can get up to jump up to over three meters uh, which is a great adaptation. There's a beautiful big male about to walk through across the road here, sporting those beautiful... Oh, he's just stopped to have a little browse there on on uh, some available vegetation. But you'll see that gorgeous set of, set of horns there. And I'm sure most people know, you know, these are antelope. They're not in. They're in the family, a different, completely different family um, or group, or whatever you want to call that, uh, than than deer. And a lot of people, if you're watching in countries that do have deer, the difference between them is that you know uh, the deer shed their antlers. Uh, uh, deers have antlers, and antelope have horns. And uh, that's just a really rough idea to. We've got a question from Jason that's just come in about, do we get sable in the area? Well, you know what, Jason, I haven't actually seen a sable here, but I do remember watching. I think it was, and there was a lone sable uh, bull. Brian, is that correct? Yeah. yeah. And he was standing on Juma Dam Wall. I think it might have been on the dam cam. Uh, maybe someone out there could uh, verify that for me. And uh, he was a... a beautiful sable bull standing on Juma, cam uh, Juma Dam Wall. And I'm not sure exactly when it was, but I do remember seeing it. And I thought it was extraordinary because they are the most beautiful. They're the, like the Rolls Royce of uh, antelope, that's for sure. But thank you for your question, mate. Um, but we're sitting with a beautiful, beautiful herd of, of impala right now. And they are just one of my favorite, favorite antelope. So gentle and so beautifully, beautifully adapted. Thank you very much, my friends. It was nice to spend time with them. And I love these little red-billed oxpeckers on this boy here. Just that one. There we go. There's that herd. They're just moving off up into the vegetation here, and they'll eat a little bit of a little bit of vegetation that they can get. Some will graze, some will browse. Very adaptive antelope. Whilst we're moving up to see if uh, Karula has gotten to a better position, I'm going to try and find her again. She, oh, we lost sight of her. Let's cross over to Jamie and see what she's up to. We'll see you right now. And look at what we have found here. Brent is currently hot on the trail, finding... We know it is them for a couple of reasons, eh? and I think they were 100% successful at some point during the evening. However, they were successful in a way that they got something small. I don't quite know what this was because they've eaten.
then just chop and change between. So sometimes those little things occur. Uh, always apologise to you, but uh, I'm sure you understand. Sending a signal out of the African bush, out of Land Rovers and out of backpacks is uh, a pretty incredible stunt in itself. So I want to come and try and find this beautiful girl and her little ones again. Just keeping an eye out here to see if she's moved. So everyone, uh, I'd love to ask you as well, if you can, um, you know, sometimes you'll need to help me along. I haven't been here for seven months. You might have to help me with some statistics if I come across lions or other leopards, and I love having you on board. You are like my encyclopedia. You guys know more about these animals uh, probably than I do about their history and that, and that's those stories. So I'd love to call on you when um, the time comes. Uh, I'll ask you loads of questions as well. So we're just coming back up to uh, to where Karula is, and there's another vehicle there, so I'm just keeping my voice down, and we'll just go up there very, very gently. Um, but Rachel has just messaged us and given us a comment that her first memory or most memorable experience is when her parents gave her a National Geographic subscription as a kid. So, Rachel, that is absolutely brilliant to hear. I have to agree with you. Uh, I find them hard to hard to ever pass on. I've got a collection of hundreds. Okay, guys, I think we're going to cross to Brent. He's got something very exciting. Well, they kept us on the run and hunting for most of the morning, but here they are, the Inkahoma Pride. I can only see four females. One, two, three, four five cubs. So the fifth female with the three little ears. Oh look, we're being stalked for him. Suddenly decided to charge at us, that little one. Oops. Oh, they're so playful this morning. So if you hear that click, click, it's just me taking a few pictures. Oh, look at that. Tackle time. Let's see if that tail proves too irres irresistible to jump on. Oh, big tackle! Now oh, that lionesses look like they might have heard something. Just stopping and listening. trying to see if I can hear or see what they've heard. They are going into a particularly difficult area now, but we will stick with them. Um, let's have a look. I'm just going to have to plan which way we're going to go. And they might stop in the shade. It's quite warm already. FMF, just, um, they're just off to the northeast of me now. Stop in the shade for a little bit, or they might keep moving.
Sorry about this, everybody. Perhaps something has pushed over the Gauri repeater, just like the elephants have pushed over this marula tree. Our technical team is rushing around, madly trying to fix it, and we'll be back with you as soon as we can. Hi everyone, we are experiencing technical difficulties, but please bear with us. Our Hi everyone, we are experiencing technical difficulties, but please bear with us. Our engineering Unfortunately, we're experiencing tech difficulties. That's one of the things about being alive and in the bush. But our tech crew is on it and not asleep like the lions behind me. Hopefully, we'll be back with you shortly. Sorry about that guys, we're back with uh, the Inkahumas and Cubs. So all four lionesses are here. The fifth lioness, who's still got very young cubs in a den, is not present at the moment. So it looks like they've stopped for a bit of a rest. Now we could hear some zebras not too far from here. I think that's what the lioness heard a bit earlier. But it is getting warm, so they might rest up here for the rest of the day. Oh. Mom, I'm hungry. So you just gotta be on the radio. Obi, Obi. Obi and Kormas crossed um, on Vertilla Axis. Uh, we're just to the north of Sandy Patch. Sorry, I didn't copy, but there's um, only two stations here if you're interested. I didn't copy, but there's um, only two stations here if you're interested. So Greg's wondering, how is the injured cub keeping up? Uh, it looks like that injury wasn't as serious as we initially thought. I'm trying to see where it is. Um, but all the cubs I've seen are walking quite well this morning. 
Okay, they going back towards where we came from. Let's just suit around. Just moving deeper into the shed. Not going back. Look at them. So that's one, two, three. And there are two more cubs off to the right slightly, suckling on mom. And none of them seem to be having too much of a problem walking. And they are incredibly resilient animals. How's that, Vim? There we go. So there's the other two. So we'll wait to see if they move. But I think it was one of those three cubs. One looked like it might have a slight limp. But they are incredibly quick to recover from muscle injuries. Ow. I'm trying to see what's happening. The other lionesses look like they're on the move, so I think she's going to do the same. Now, there were some zebra we could hear up ahead. Little greedy gutters. Look at that. Isn't that just too cute? See, there's the one. Actually, there's the one. It looks like it's got a bit of a limp, but still a massive recovery and uh, improvement from when we last saw that little cub walking around. Okay, looks like they're on the move again. Hold on, hold on, isn't this exciting? Now, while we try to get around to where these lines are moving to, uh, let's go to another cat and some more cubs. Well, we've come back to this beautiful, beautiful leopard. Karula is just laying there surveying the scene. Her babies are just about to come up and pounce on her. 